we are the end people if you tired of seeing me i'm done this is it like two more hours and that's it that's why you gotta stick with me if you if you stuck with me up to this point you know what i mean just yeah two more hours you know 120 more minutes let's go yeah I got a pretty Los Angeles lab with a lot of money. I've had most of these books out for at least some I've had out since about June, some way before June. You know what I mean? Like I said, man, I don't mind. The money's going to the library. So. Me too. It's not my name. It's a me too. Hopefully some young immigrant 50 years from now don't feel the need to want to do something stupid as this to convince, you know, people that, you know, that vote matters. Hey, this is from 2010, right? Now, the significance of this, me personally, I had realized the significance of this then, but not to the level that I've realized it now. That was in 2010, that was eight years ago. I'm about to be 34 now. So I was 26 then. You know what I mean? If you're 26 in America right now and you're not thinking about voting, you're not thinking about doing all the extra stuff, you know what I mean? Like, I, the importance of that cannot be, cannot be stressed further than I have already stressed it further. You know what I mean? This is from The Guardian. If you don't remember, it's the publication in, in England. And this pretty much tells my point when I say, if you're a person of color in America, you say, what did Obama do for minorities and for poor people and for black people in America? And I, and I say to you, what did you do for that man to go out and make sure that he has a, a Congress of his same party so he wouldn't be a limb dog president? You know what I mean? Like, if you say that this, this article right here is for you, you know what I mean? And it is by Michael Tomaski. It was published on Wednesday, the 3rd of November of 2010 at theguardian.com. And it is titled, Turnout Explains a Lot. By comparing the 20, 2008 exit, national exit polls and the numbers from, yes, and these from yesterday, that means he was talking about the election of 2010. The Tea Party election, mind you. This, is, this was when the Tea Party came out and like, uh, we got to get our White House back. We got to get our country back. Like, yeah, that's when white angst started. And Trump took advantage of it. And five years later, when he said Mexicans are rapists and murderers, and we're going to build a wall, and he's going to make America great again because the black man did not make America great. Even though the black man had made America great. No, the black man did not make America great. He restored America greatness around the world, and he continued to make his greatness. America was never not great. America hasn't been great. Ha America hasn't been not great over the last hundred or some years. Take my word from this African, you know. But I digress though. By comparing these 2008 exit, national exit polls and these from yesterday, both from CNN and asking essential identity, identical questions, we learn some useful things. Certain figures were not very different from 2008. The men and women split was same over both elections 47 percent male and 53 percent female see that's why i'm talking that's how i'm talking to my sisters man like women are so much more responsible and so much more caring about certain things that males do the only time men can come out and, and post that shit is when they know it's something that's gonna make it seem like we are not the wrongly anointed superior gender. Like, I, I digress, I'm sorry. The quote, white no college category, which we roughly equate with the concept of the white working class, poor whites, 
accounted for the same 39% of this year's vote as he did in 2008. No, I mean, so. Those voters did, did vote somewhat more Republican this time. That means in 2010 they voted more Republican than they did in 2008. You remember the article that was talking about how some white Americans voted for Obama out of some kind of guilt? You know, it was those. They had to bring it back to their senses and let them know that they should have never voted for a black man to society. It's sad, but it's the truth, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't help you if you ain't believing what I'm trying what I'm trying to drive home, you know. They went from McCain by fifty-eight to forty percent and voted Republican this this year by sixty-two to thirty-five percent. Man. Here as far as I can see at the three Big top line differences. Now, I'm going to tell you, man, these three differences are wild as fuck, yo. These three differences right here are wild as fuck. Ooh. Before I get into that, right, I forgot. It's one thing I wanted to touch on. It's one thing I wanted to touch on. California is 59th. California Assembly 59th District, right? And this is from... Wikipedia now. Now, you remember the issue I was talking about, Leslie Hagen, Hagen Morgan is running it? Okay. It says the California 59th State Assembly District is one of 80 state assembly districts in California. It is currently represented by Democrat Reggie John Sawyer of Los Angeles. And it has a population, according to the 2010 census, of 465,000. And a voting age population of 319,000, a citizen voting age population of 169,000. The demographic is 2.6% white, 19.38% black, and 75% Latino, 2% Asian, and 0.3% Native American. You know what I mean? That sounds about right. And it has registered voters. The registered voters total is 193,000, right? All right. Now, this is the kicker here. This is the kicker here now. Now you see why I'm only speaking to minorities when I'm talking about reading and voting, especially voting. This is the kicker here now. The registered voters rate is 193,000, right, of the population. In the 2012 state assembly race, when you had the first time uh, Reggie John saw you won, only a total of 16,000 people voted in the primary and a total of 77,000 people voted in the in the in the what you call it a general general election from representing that community that district right there 59th district that i'm residing in right now there are all these people who i've resided with that that knows me and a lot of people in this community and, and i plan on voting you know what i mean i'm i'm trying to drive home a point please don't be mad at me you know what i mean 77,000 people voted out of 193,000 registered voters. That was in 2012, six years ago. Two years later, in 2014, four years ago, only 28,000 people voted out of 193,000 registered voters. Two years after that, it's two years ago, in 2016, the number went up, 77,000 people voted. That's a problem, man. That is a problem. Like, that is a problem. You know, like, I, I, I don't know if you see where I'm going with it, but that is a problem, man. Come on. That's not, you cannot have that many people registered to, to vote in a district, and people don't show out and go vote in more numbers than that. You know what I mean? Like, that's not right. So, since the person who's trying to represent this, this community and countless others that are in that 59th assembly, please, man, go out and vote, man. Just, just build a habit. It's a good habit to have. Back to the Guardian. Here, as far as I can see, are the three big top line differences. Difference number one, the 2008 electorate, that's the year Obama became president now, was 74% white plus 13% black and 9% Latino. The 2010 numbers 
was 78 percent white that means white people four four percent more white people voted 10 percent black three percent less black people voted and eight percent latino one percent less latinos voted two years after obama became president so it was a considerably whiter electorate difference number two in 2008 18 to 29 year olds made up 18 percent and those 65 plus made up 16 percent young people actually outvoted old people when obama was on the ticket in 2008. this year in 2010 according to the article the young cohort was down by 11 percent and the seniors was up by a whopping 23 percent of the electorates that's a 24 point, point flip you know what that tells me that tells me that then white folks realize that oh they made a mistake when they decided that it was time for a black man to be president he was going to actually try to make sure that all these poor people were were actually getting good stuff out of their government for a change it was a start if he didn't feel the effect, it, it's things that take time. These things take time. But the ascendancy of this dumbass in chief has really led to the rollback of most of those things that that man started. You know what I mean? And that's a problem. That is a problem. But something can be done about it. Difference number three. The liberal, moderate, conservative numbers in 2008 was... If you don't know what that means, it means Democrat, Independent, Republican numbers was 22% Democrat, 44% Independent, and 34% Republican. Yo, the Democratic Party, man, y'all kill me with that. The numbers for 2010 was 20% Democrats, which was 2% less, 39% Independence, which was about five percent less, and forty-one percent Republicans, which was five percent more. Tea Party movement, motherfucker. Let me stop. A big conservative jump, but in all likelihood, because liberals did not vote in big numbers. Add to these numbers the fact that overall turnout was down by about a third or more, from nearly 130 million to about 82.5 million. That just means we didn't go out and vote. That's at least 45 million no-shows. And the exit tells us the bulk of them were liberal, young, black, Latino. If 25 million of these no-shows had voted, Democratic losses were pretty obviously, would pretty obviously have been in the normal range, and they still controlled the House. There tends to be a lot of hand-wringing after an experience like this about the really big questions of what the party stands for. And I have and will do some of that because it matters. But it may well matter less than, than electoral mechanics. Democrats will probably do far better to invest $200 million in 2014 GOTV operations than in soul searching. Who are we project? Off-year turnout is a perennial problem for the party, and it's only going to get worse as ideological battle lines and society becomes more rigid, which they are. This man pretty much predicted without naming it, what happened with Trump? So, this will be something I'll be watching to, for to see if Democrats understand the climate they're in. This was eight years ago, yeah. You know what I mean? So, what well, Michael Tomasco was pretty much... If, if, if Michael Tomasco and I was a black man thinking the way he was thinking along those lines while he was writing that, he would have called black folks out. But he wasn't going to, you know what I mean? That... that that's a fine line to tiptoe. And you might be sitting here thinking, but oh yeah, but you have your African Buddhist scratching ass, they ain't afraid of that. I'm, I'm not really tripping, you know what I mean? I've had to deal with it too long. I've had to deal with it for the last 20 years. Like, ask anybody who knows me, who's standing next to you, listening to me right now, I will argue you to the death. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If you prove that I'm wrong, I own up to it, you know what I mean? But nine times out of ten, we're going to have some fun with it first before, you know what I mean? Okay, before I move any further, 
let me finish up. Like I said, man, as much as I, I tried to read all these books, it was going to take about 200 and more hours of videos to be uploaded on YouTube that I would have had it done, and that would have been, that would have been overkill. 100, 108 hours is overkill. It is, but not really. Nah, man. And in that time that I've done this 100 hours, I know plenty of young people who swear they try and be rappers but they ain't trying to get no job right now while they're on their way to try and be rappers i'm trying to prove a point i'm not trying to show off on that i'm, I'm just saying like just priorities yeah now nah, i mean prizes not everybody gonna be a rapper but you got a better chance of being a professional plumber of being a carpenter of being a mechanic of being an engineer of being an electrician of being an hvac person Or even being a vendor, or even working in security, and I mean, just do, do something, you know what I mean? Like, if you know you're out there right now, try and make it as a rapper, and you ain't got no job, stop. That's why I say if you ain't got no job. Don't be mad at me if you try and make it as a rapper, and you got a job, and you taking your business, you know what I mean? You, you do what you do on the side, you, don't be mad at me for that. I'm not coming for you. But you know, like I know better than you, you know better than I do. That you know some people who you who, who you in in that circle with who I'm talking about, you know what I mean? But you know you think the same thing, but sometimes you can't tell them. But even if you tell them, you know how people always say, "Oh, keep it a, keep it real, keep it 100." That shit don't. Man. People ain't trying to hear that shit, man. They ain't trying to hear that. Shit. I digress though. John McCain's Hidden Valley. This is the last chapter before the acknowledgement and it's titled Hidden Valley. I, I'm, I'm just going to close it out with this, you know what I mean? Like I said, go pick up the book. It is an awesome ass book, y'all. It is an excellent book. I can now, man, you will love it. You will love it. Oh, hold up. I, I think Marcellus' book coming out on Tuesday. Oh, shit now. Marcellus. I think that book coming out on the 22nd. Or has it come out already? Let me see. I forgot about it. Forgot about it. I got engulfed in all this. October 23rd. It's coming out tomorrow. Oh, let's go. Let's go. What's up, Marcellus? What's going on, man? I know, man. You tell people you went to Columbia and you from Compton, huh? Yeah, let me, it's like that. Let me start. What's up, man? What's up? Hey, man. I miss Sports Nation, man. ESPN just killed that motherfucker, man. You can in tune into ESPN today after CV Negro over there. Yeah, I see Bomani Jones and whichever black person they decide to throw in around the own or and highly questionable, you know what I mean? But just seeing whether it was Beetle, LZ, and Marcellus, man, just seeing y'all three up in that joint, like, y'all know Beetle Black, right? You know what I mean? She just said, real, 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 real light skinned sister. <laughs> What's up, Beetle? <laughs> hey, 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 girl, I like your style, girl. I'm trying to tell you. You ain't gonna get up. You ain't got to deal with that little racist ass white boy and you still get that money. ESPN is obligated to get that money. And you back with the brothers on countdown. Basketball is back. I'm just saying, man. I, I know right now it's a lot of racist ass, redneck ass white boys who probably saying, yeah, they're like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah they talk about that nigga loving that word I don't like to say, you know what I mean? You know, you know how they are, Beto. You know how they are. I know you don't give a fuck about them. Let them hate. Stop it. Stop it. But yeah, man. I miss Sports Nation, man. See those faces, man. I can't hear. I can't hear LZ. But you know. White folks don't like to see that so much. I can't see Michael Smith on that show no more. Jamil Hill. I mean, Jamil, she was going to leave anyway. You know what I mean? That girl, like, man. This crack is doing too much. This crack is doing too much. I feel you, girl. Great with that, though. But yeah. Miss that though, man. 
Marcellus' book is called Never Shut Up. Why you're hearing this right now is out. Check it out. I, I haven't read it yet, but I already know that man is smart as fuck. If it wasn't for him, I would have never found out who Malcolm Gladwell was. I would have never read Blink or The Tipping Point. So I tell you, those books right there will blow your motherfucking mind, especially Blink. Tipping Point is Tipping Point. Blink? If you really grasp the concepts of blink and be able to tap into your adaptive subconscious and, and things like shit, namely listen with your eyes and not your ears so much, your ears are already gonna listen. You know what I mean? But I digress. So I, I had I had to just put that out there because you know my man book coming out this week. Let's go. That was awesome. This is from the vote.com. It says, President signs executive order mandating that poor people walk or lose quote-unquote welfare by Angela Helm on April the 18th of 2018 and is filed on the school's mock <laughs> That was fun. It says, without much fanfare, totally apropos given what's been happening in the wall of the White House in the last 72 hours, President Dump Trump signed an executive order Tuesday that will force recipients of supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits, Medicaid and low-income housing subsidies to find work or lose their assistance. Trump quietly signed the long-anticipated order, oddly named Trump quietly signed the long-anticipated order, oddly named quote, reducing poverty in America by promoting economic opportunity and economic mobility. Given that many government agencies, including the Department of Health and Human Services, have already begun issuing waivers to Republican governors who want to impose stricter work requirements on Medicaid recipients to cut costs, it will not make much of an impact, according to the, to the New York Times. The fact remains that the most able-bodied adults who receive federal aid in form of subsidized health care or housing already work, but are still unable to make ends meet. Others receive exemptions for legitimate reasons. And this is a quote from the Times. The order gave all cabinet departments 90 days to produce plans to that impose work requirements on able-bodied aid recipients and black ineligible immigrants from receiving aid, while drafting a list of recommended regulatory and policy changes to push recipients off the roads and into jobs. See, they had to throw immigrants in there, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a, I'm a remind y'all again in case you didn't get it last time. If an immigrant is illegal in this country and did not go through some fraudulent ways, they're not going to have a social security number. That's why they have to walk under the table. And if you don't have a social security number for you to put on that form, you're not going to get approved for any of these things. Does that make sense? So any immigrants who, who qualifies for anything like this, that means they have a green card, they're legal, they have a social security at least, you know what I mean? They have something going for them. They're not ineligible, they're not illegal. So this was all rhetoric and ways to try to, just to keep perpetuating their phrase, illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants, just to, you know, like, it's just hatred, you know what I mean? Like, but I digress though. The aim, Trump aid said, is to prop federal and state officials to take a tougher stance with aid recipients, millions of whom currently receive exemptions from existing work requirements because they are in training programs, provide care for relatives, or volunteer their labor. The Agriculture Department is already pushing, is already pressuring states to impose work requirements in the, in the SNAP program, the program formerly known as, as, as uh, food stamps. Earlier this year, the Department of Health and Human Services granted a waiver, a waiver to Arkansas so it could require Medicaid recipients to get jobs, participate in job training, or engage in job searches at least 80 hours a month. 
According to the Kaiser Foundation, most able-bodied adults who do not already have jobs face obstacles in working, including psychiatric disability, criminal records, and difficult family issues. Yet the narrative from the Trump administration says differently. Quote, our country suffers from nearly record high welfare enrollment. That's a lie. Said Andrew Bremberg, the president's domestic policy chief, according to the Times, which notes that temporary assistance for needy TANF payments to poor people are approaching record lows. It's not that many people on those roads, man. You need to stop lying. Trump also reportedly wants to change the world welfare to include not only cash payments but also food and medical benefits, SNAP and Medicaid. Or he just doesn't give AF and I quote, Mr. Trump several aid said is unconcerned or perhaps even unaware of the distinction between cash assistance and other safety net programs. He calls them all welfare and we know what connotation goes along with that. Angela Helm. Ms. Bronner Helm is a contributing editor at The Roots, Mouthy Black Girl, Rosalind Carter, Mental Health Fellow, Shea Butter Families, Virgo Sign, Virgo Sun, Aries Moon. Uh, yo, this article just made me, this article just made me think about some, yo. I just noticed why The Roots have short articles, like The Roots have some of the shortest articles I read, yo. I, it's sad, I hate to say this, but most people that uh, they want to sit there and read a 30, 40 paragraph article. I, I hate to go there, but I am going there. It, it's, This is to the state of Arizona that Mr. John McCain represented up to his death. Got my Arizona mucho mango, yeah, I get that mango. What? I can't pick the mango of the tree like I'm an African, but I got my mango right here. Hidden Valley. I was ruthless for more than half of my 81 years, beginning with my beginning with my itinerant childhood. My father's Navy career required us to move constantly, just as my grandfather's service had disrupted his childhood. My father was born in Council Bluffs, Iowa, not because his family resided there or had some connection to the town, but because his parents were moving to the West Coast at the time and he arrived on the way. I lost track of how many places we lived, how many schools I attended. The actual moving, of course, was undertaken by my capable, adventurous mother. Mothers again, yeah. Hauling three kids across the country, detouring here and there to visit some natural wonder or cultural attraction. Eventually, my parents sent me to a boarding school, Episcopal High School in Alexandria, Virginia, so that I could receive my secondary education and have the same circle of friends in one location for longer than a year. We didn't see my father for long stretches during his deployment. He was gone almost all of World War II and at sea for much of the Korean War, serving as an executive officer on a cruiser. We spent time together when he had short duty. Even then, he was at work most of the time, including weekends and, and holidays. In the summers, when he was stateside, he would take us to the McCain family estate in the Mississippi Delta, a cotton plantation purchased in 1951 by my great-great-grandfather William Alexander McCain and named for the local area, t -Oc. My great-uncle Joe, my grandfather's younger brother, ran t -Oc back then. It was a big place, a couple thousand acres with a comfortable mother's home that had replaced a more impressive manor house lost to fire generations before, a company store with a gasoline pump, a cut engine, and, and tenant farmers descended from the slaves who had been held in bondage by my ancestors and taken the name McCain. 
if you black out there right now trying to say, oh, why you talking about you like that, that white man, he come from from family of state. Listen, man, if you ignorance of the fact that maybe, maybe a good 67 or 74% of white Americans today are descendants from slave owners, if you ignorance of that fact, you need to go back to the beginning of this and look at this whole series binge watch this whole series again and think again you know what i mean mr mckinney has just been honest the man was a good-hearted man may he rest in perfect peace the man has just been honest the sad part about this i can make the argument that trump's family does not descend from a line of slave owners because his family line could not be traced in America right here because his father was an immigrant from somewhere else at some point in America. His, his, not his father, his family line, the person that, start, that started the Trump name in America emigrated from Germany. I forget the exact year. But if he was in the 1800s, nine times out of ten, he became slave owners. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yes, I am giving your racist white president a break on him not being the descendant of slave owners. That's why I fear Mike Pence more than I fear him. Trump's racism is new. Com in the grand scheme of American racism, Trump racism is new. Mike Pence is one deep. If John McCain was a racist white boy, if John McCain was a racist white boy, his racism would have been on the level of Mike Pence's. Do you get that? Just like he's admitting that they had plans, they had slaves, you know what I mean? Mike, Mike Pence probably was born whipping on a on a slave on one of his grandpappy's plantation in Indiana somewhere, or wherever he's from. The same goes for Jerry Jones, being born in Oklahoma. You know what I mean? I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, man. You know, just saying, like. I digress though. I hunted fish and rode horses then and enjoyed time with my father and my teasing, funny Uncle Joe. Those are cherished memories, but my connection to the place was fleeting. And many summers and years of my childhood were spent entirely without, without my father. We learned to live with and respect his absences. My own Navy career meant more of the same frequent moves and extended absences from my family and country. I didn't mind the life really, at least not when I was single and could find fun and adventure in any temporary residence. But I knew how difficult my professional, my professional transience would be on my first wife Carol and our children. Until I remarried, left the Navy and moved to Cindy's home, Arizona, the only time I lived in the same place longer than a year was an unexpectedly lengthy stay in a foreign country that wouldn't let me leave and preferred I'd never come. He talked about when he was locked up, when he was captured in Vietnam. You know, the same, the same incident that our dumbass in chief mocked. Talk about, oh, I like guys who don't get captured. Your ass ran. You didn't even go fight your dumbass. If you the went they, you'd have probably been being go more pile or some shit. Blow up your whole unit. You dumbass, you fucking like that. Like Michael Shannon said, man, yo, Mike, thank you for that interview, man. He said, you are incapable of deep, complex thought. I digress, man. I'm sorry, man. Like, TRPTSD, I think I've solved it, though. I'm almost at the end. I think if people go vote and there's a blue wave, my TRPTSD will go away. If this man becomes a lame duck president, as lame as he is, my TRPTSD will go away. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, man. If you think white folks are not gung-ho about voting for him and Republicans, you are sadly mistaken. 
We ain't want nothing yet. Just cause people are mad at him, don't mean shit. Yo. Can you imagine if the Jaguars get Colin Kaepernick and get motivated to that point where they actually make it to the Super Bowl with Kaepernick and they will win? Ooh. Trump will be mad. That would be one mad ass white boy. He would be madder than he was when Obama became president. He ain't gonna talk about Mexicans no more. He can't, he can't talk about that no more because he already, he already, he already been dead to the ground. Now he gonna talk about us. Like he wanted to in the first place, you know what I mean? I digress though. Among the few advantages of my five and a half year in Hanoi was that Carl and the kids could live in one place, Orange Park, Florida, the entire time I was gone. I think the experience of my wandering youth is one of the reasons I've always been restless. As I noted in the, prior, in the previous chapter, my curiosity and eagerness for new sights and experiences I, I likely got from my, from my indefatigable mother. I didn't regret not having a hometown. Before I moved to Arizona, whenever I was asked where I was from, I just answered all around or the states. And I felt not the least bit sorry that I couldn't be more specific. But something changed in the years after I left the Navy. I began to appreciate the comforts and solace that could be found in belonging to a place smaller and more intimate than my entire country. Cindy and I decided we would raise our family in Arizona and I could commit to Washington given Congress's short work weeks. That usually meant I could leave Washington on Tuesday night or Friday morning and return Monday afternoon and regular recess would allow me to spend weeks at home. Of course, there were weekends and recess period when I couldn't be in Arizona, when Congress had to walk into the weekend or when I campaigned for Republican candidates in other states. My travel abroad as a member of the Armed Services Committee has consumed many recess periods as well. But still, I was able to spend more time with my family in the same home than I had ever thought would be possible. In my first year in Congress, I had a meeting with members of the Arizona Farm Bureau. After an hour spent discussing issues there so far unfamiliar to me, I mentioned the matter Cindy and I had recently started discussing. We were living in a small house in Tempe we had just acquired so, so I would meet my district residency requirements. We didn't have any children yet, but we were planning to and contemplating finding a place in the northern part of the state where our family could spend time together on weekends and holidays. Say, if any of you know of a place that's up for sale up north that's on water, I added as we were exchanging goodbyes. Let me know. My, my wife and I might be interested in it. As everyone knows, water is scarce in Arizona, and finding property for a reasonable price that's near any isn't an easy assignment. But some months later, I received a call from the head of the Farm Bureau. He had heard of a place for sale near Cottonwood. It's on, it's on, it's on Oak Creek, he informed me. You might want to take a look at it. I called Cindy as she drove the 120 miles from Mesa to the spot in Yavapai County near Conville, Arizona, where a winding, bumping dirt road takes you to, down a steep hill to, to, to an oasis. Morgan pioneers were settled in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847, not long after the U.S. claimed the Utah Territory after the war with, with Mexico. Brigham Young was declared president of the Mormon Church, and in that capacity, he dispatched missionaries to other parts of the Southwest newly acquired from our defeated foe. Mormons founded communities in all of Arizona, including quite a few small towns in the high, beautiful, desolate country in the northern part of the state, St towns like Eager, St. John's, and Snowflake. Many hardy souls take claim in even more isolated locations if there were reliable water sources nearby, including land along a Suhorn bend of Oak Creek. Okay, before I continue this whole paragraph, I'm going to skip forward. I'm going to skip forward. 
Okay. So page 376. He goes on to say, We've spent all of the time we could here. We celebrated holidays and birthdays. We swam in the creeks, fished the pond, hiked the hills and barbecued. The place always teamed with kids, our own and the Harpers and their friends, until the mid-2000s when I started spending the 4th of July with the troops in Afghanistan and in Iraq. We always celebrated the holidays here with dozens of friends we invited for all manner of recreation. We football games, first march up the hill into an Indian cave, swimming in the falls, lively dinners along the bank of the creek. We were here after elections to celebrate victories and for consolation after losses. The prescription for both included grilled, grilled ribs and a slowly sipped vodka on ice. The McKenna Institute convenes a weekend forum every spring at a resort in Sedona, attended by prominent figures in government, business, education, and the military. Foreign and defense ministers and even a few heads of government have come. We host a, a dinner on, Sunday, on Saturday night for the attendees. It's especially beautiful here in the spring, and the property has made such an impression on our guests that word of Hidden Valley's charm has spread worldwide. Carlos Slim, the billionaire from Mexico City, one of the world's wealthiest men told me he thought it was one of the nicest places he's ever been. I receive regular solicitation from senior officials of foreign governments. I, ha I hear you have a beautiful place near Sedona. I'd love to see it someday. Yes, I loved it when I first saw it and had a vision of what it might become, and now we're nearly there, and I love it all the more. I lived so much of my life on the move, compensating in other ways for the hometown I was denied. I had no connection to one place, no safe harbor where I could rest carelessly. Landscapes and communities pass too quickly to form lasting attachments of shared, of shared history that calm you when, when old age finally confounds your restlessness. I was almost 40 years when I moved to Arizona. Landscapes and communities pass so quickly to form lasting attachments of shared history that calm you when old age finally conf confounds your restlessness. I was almost 45 when I moved to Arizona. In the nearly four decades that have passed, Arizona has enchanted and, and calmed me. Near the end of his life, Barry Goldwater, a great outdoor man, nah, tried to describe his affection for the state. Quote, Arizona is 113,400 square feet miles of heaven that God cut out. Then he paused to choke back tears before managing to add, I love it so much. Yo, I ain't even gonna lie. I don't know what about Arizona, but I know people who I've met in LA who just love Arizona, yo. I ain't even gonna lie. I had one of my man's black. This nigga black, yo, Jamaican cat. He used to come out here all the time when we leave. This was back in the early 2000s when we were living out in Maryland, you know what I mean? This nigga black used to come out here all the time. Come back. Got some of that, that stung, got some of that stinky, icky, icky, that stinky, icky, icky, ooh wee. Hey, remember now, this was like 2003, 2004, so hydro wasn't the normal, you know what I mean? Top shelf wasn't in the normal, you know what I mean? Like, that was, you had to get that special, you know what I mean? So, yeah, black is to come out, come out, they get that, yeah. I'm sorry. Memories, can't help it. I have experienced every sense of spectacular natural beauty this magnificent state possesses. I've hiked Canyon de Chile and the Grand Canyon rim to rim. I would love to see the Grand Canyon, yo. Hey, Jeba, if it's one place in America I, I want to share the experience with you or visiting, it's literally the Grand Canyon, yo. I ain't even gonna lie. I would love to just stand there and just hold your hand, yo. Like, just, you know, they, ah. That place look, look awesome as hell, yo. You can just imagine the greatness, the amazingness of just nature and life and how everything else is, is so minuscule, yo, when you stand on such a vast thing. I can only imagine, though. But. I've rafted down the Colorado and houseboated on Lake Powell. I've walked the trails in Saguaro National Park. Been stuck muted by the landmark landscape of Monument Valley and spent countless hours happily following hidden paths in wilderness areas. 
I've driven through the desert in the spring after a wet winter and gasped at the profusion of color, the, mesmer the mesmerizing beauty of desert wildflower in southern bloom. I love it so much and I am so grateful for the privilege of representing the state and its people in the United States Senate. I've been to just about every community that Arizona's carved from the wilderness and made thrive. Places that never stopped growing and places that were abandoned to history when opportunities were exhausted. Places that rose and declined where we reimagined and made to prosper again by the hardworking self-starting dreamer, dreamers Arizona att attract in such great numbers. He used that word dreamers right here to send a message to his Arizona constituency that yeah, don't fall for that Republican racialized, you know, I mean, xenophobic dreamer connotation that has been perpetrated. Thank you, Mr. McKay. That's that's one of the few reasons why I loved your book. Because you're truly hoping that maybe the same people that be, that have been Republicans that believe in the Republican Party like you do, the same values you had as a Republican, they will continue that, you know what I mean? They because it's not this guy, I don't think. That's why I'm asking all those people to please come over to the Democratic side and vote blue. I'm just saying. Like, you can help inject, you can be good for the Democratic Party. You can inject some backbone into it. We're not going to take your guns from you. We don't want to do that. Like Nelson Mandela said, we don't want to drive you to the water, to the edge of the sea, rather. You know what I mean? We don't want to take your guns from you. We don't want to take your Bibles from you. We just want you to not have such a backwards interpretation of what it means to be a gun owner or what it means to be a Bible thumper. I can thump a Bible with the best of them. But it takes too much hate in my heart to thump it like y'all thump it. Y'all thumping trumpets. I had to go there, I'm sorry. Good morning. You are go tired for seeing me face. You just a bit by stand. I've I've been to just about every community in Arizona that Arizonans carved from the wilderness and made thrive. Places that never stopped growing and places that were abandoned to history when opportunities were exhausted. Places that arose and declined where we imagined and made to prosper again by the hardworking, self-starting dreamers Arizona attract in such great numbers. I've been astonished by the resourcefulness of generations of Arizonans in Yuma and Page, Jerome and Kingman, Bisbee and Flagship, who struggled, achieved, lost, and struggled again to build from their freedom and opportunities, strong, prospering, decent communities in the challenging and beautiful place that had won their hearts. We will change as all places do. Most people will come, as I once came, to make a new home to f or find the only home they ever really have in towns and cities and rural communities that will be better for their presence. Some will come from other states and some will come from other countries. They will face the challenges of their time and place. They will suffer setbacks and they will stick with it and prevail. And years from now, their stories, character, and accomplishments will inspire other lucky newcomers, as I was once inspired, who came to live in beauty and make the most of their lives. I won't see it, but I wish I could. I, I, man, I'm trying to tell you, man. Yo, just like Ted Kennedy passed away around the time that Obama took office, yo, McCain's passing is quite literally, could literally be that straw that breaks the camel back on the Republican Party and on progress in America if minorities don't step up to the plate and show up in droves and vote blue, yo. I ain't gonna lie. Like, this man knew he was at the end of his life now. Like, I am making a big deal about it because this man has, this man gave his life, literally, gave blood and was such a shit for his country. Something this dumbass in chief that has exposed all this, all, all this bigoted prejudice. 
You know what I mean? White supremacy, white racism, institutional racism, structural racism. Like, quite literally, yo, it is a problem. Like, this man so, this man knew it was a bad thing, but you know what? I digress, man. Like, I'm, I'm just saying, man, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, but John McCain was one of those dudes, and I think his passing this year, even if the 50 years after Dr. King was killed is not enough to make people go out and go vote in droves. Just a simple fact that this man penned, penned these words. You know what I mean? This man has written plenty of books before. But this book right here is probably the only one of his books that I've read completely because of the timing and the significance of it. If you don't read it, I ain't mad at you. If you go vote, I'm good. And John McCain is good. In his grave right now, he's, he's probably, he's probably, probably doing this right now. He probably like, what up, my nigga? But he gonna be like, oh, 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 not that kind of nigga. Nah, he ain't gonna say that. I'm just kidding. Trump will say that dumb shit, though. I bet you if they ever have a video of Trump and, and, and Kanye just sitting there chilling, smoking cigars and shit, talking about grabbing vaginas, you know what I mean? If there's ever a recording of them to just sitting there chilling, I bet you Trump is in there talking about, yo, what up, my nigga? Like, you know what I mean? Don't get me where there ain't no more with it. A lot of, a lot of us got white friends who say, like, everybody use that word like it's nothing, you know what I mean? I'm just saying. I hate to say, but I digress. I'm sorry. Mr. McCain goes on to say, I won't see it, but I wish I could. I don't know how much longer I will be here. Maybe I'll have another five years. Maybe with the advances of, in oncology, they will find new treatments for my cancer that will extend my life. Maybe I'll be gone before you read this. My predicament is well, rather unpredictable. But I'm prepared for either contingency or at least I'm getting prepared. I have some things I would like to take care of first. Some work that needs finishing and some people I need to see. And I want to talk to my fellow Americans a little more if I may. My fellow Americans, no association ever mattered more to me. We're not always right. We're impetuous and impatient and rush into things without knowing what we're really doing. We argue over little differences endlessly and exaggerate them into lasting breaches. We can be selfish and quick sometimes to shift the blame for our mistakes to others. But our country, this of thee, what great good we've done in the world, so much more good than harm. We served ourselves, of course, but we helped other, make others free, safe, and prosperous because we were not threatened by others, other people's liberty and success. We need each other. We need friends in the world, and they need us. The bell tolls for us, my friends. For whom the bell tolls? The bell tolls for us, my friends. Humanity counts on us, and we ought to take measured pride in that. We have not been an island. We were involved in mankind. Before I leave, I'd like to see our politics begin to return to the purposes and practices that distinguish our history from the history of other nations. I would like to see us recover our sense that we are more alike than different. We are citizens of a republic made of shared ideals forged in a new world to replace the tribal enmity that tormented the old one. When in times of political turmoil such as this, we share that awesome heritage and their, and their responsibility to embrace it. Whether we think each other right or wrong in our views on the issues of the day, we owe each other our respect. As long as our character merits respect, as long as we share for all our differences, for all the, for all the rancorous debates that enliven and sometimes demean our politics, a mutual devotion to the ideals our nation was, was conceived to uphold, that we are created equal in liberty and equal justice and the natural rights of all. Those rights inhabit the human heart, and from there, though they may be assailed, they can, never be, they can never be wrecked. I want to urge Americans for as long as I can to remember that this shared devotion to human rights is our truest heritage and our most important loyalty. Then I would like to go back to our valley to see the creek run after the rain and hear the cottonwoods whisper in the wind. 
I want to smell the raw scented breeze and feel the sun on my shoulder. I want to watch the hawks hunt from the sycamore and then take my leave. Bound for a place near my old friend Chuck Larson in the cemetery on the servant, back where it began. The wall is a fine place and what they're fighting for and I hate very much to leave it, spoke my hero Robert Jordan in For Whom the Bell Tolls. And I do too. I hate to leave it, but I, have, but I don't have a complaint. Not one. It's been quite a ride. I've known great passions, seen amazing wonders, fought in a war, helped make a peace. I've lived very well and I've been deprived and I've been and I've been deprived of all comfort. I've been as lonely as a person can be and I've enjoyed the company of heroes. I've suffered the deepest desire and experienced the highest ex exaltation. I made a small place for myself in the history of America and the history of my times. I leave behind a loving wife who is devoted to protecting the world's most vulnerable and seven great kids who grew up to be fine men and women. I wish I had spent more time in their company, but I know they will go on to make their, their time count, be of useful service to their belief and to their fellow human beings. Their love for me and mine for them is the last strength I have. What an ingrate I will be to curse the fate that concludes the blessed life I've led. I prefer to give thanks for those blessings and my love to the people who bless me with theirs. The bell tolls for me, I knew it would, so I tried as best I could to stay a part of the main. I hope that, that those who mourn my passing and even those who don't will celebrate as I celebrate a happy life lived in perfect, in, in perfect service to a country made of ideals whose continued success is the hope of the world. And I wish all of you great adventures, great companies, and lives as lucky as, as mine. And he has a requiem by Robert Louis Stevenson, and he, and he reads, Under the wide and starry sky, dig the grave and let me lie. Glad did I live and gladly die, and I, lay, and I laid me down with a will. This be the verse you grave for me. Here he lies where he longed to be. Home is a sailor home from sea and the hunter home from the hill that was awesome i'm done with mckenna's restless wave again i couldn't get through the entire the entirety of you know, Michael Harry Dyson's What Truth Sounds Like, but go pick it up, it's an excellent read. But the last chapter there before the, the acknowledgement is awesome, you know what I mean? It's an awesome read. And it is titled, Even If Wakanda Forever. It's like, now let me stop. Oh, my bad, yeah, my bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wakanda is not real, man, but we can have a Wakanda, though. I just spilled my damn Arizona. Maybe that's the sound that I shouldn't have done this. Mm. Maybe that's the sound that I shouldn't have done this. I'm putting his ass down. And it starts. I beg you as a youth I want to say these days. Please don't judge me, but I've got a confession. I believe that most of the ills that I address in this book, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, can be engaged if not relieved. If we, yes, we read Baldwin and scores of really smart black.